Cicero, in defence of Sextus Roscius of Ameria, speech delivered in 80 before the Christian era, translated by Michael Grant, narrated by Max Latham. Section 8, final part. And what I'm going to say next, Chrysogonus, you'll not be able to deny. Out of all his father's ample fortune, Sextus Roscius has converted not a scrap of it to his own use. He has defrauded you of nothing whatsoever. He has yielded up to you every single thing that was his, counting it up and weighing it out with the most scrupulous good faith. He has handed over to you the very clothing which covered his back, the very ring he wore on his finger. Out of all his many belongings, he has one thing and one thing only left his own naked body. If this is all true, cried Sagonus, then my client begs and entreats you to allow an innocent man this one thing at least, that he should graciously be permitted to pass the rest of his life in destitution, supported by the assistance of his friends. You have taken over my farms, says Roscius. I am living on other people's charity. I raise no objection, he continues, because I am resigned and have no alternative. My house is open to you and closed to myself. Very well, I put up with it. My whole large household is at your disposal, while I lack even one single slave to call my own. This, too, I tolerate. I shall regard it as endurable. But in this case, he adds, what are all these further demands? Why do you still pursue and attack me so relentlessly? In what way do you claim I have offended against your wishes? How do I stand in the path of your ambitions? If all you were after was to commit an assassination for the sake of the spoils, you have got the spoils already, so I fail to see what more you can need. Or is it a feeling of enmity that drives you on? But I can't understand how these can possibly be enmity between yourself and a man whose farm you seized before you even knew him? Or is it fear, perhaps, your motive? Perhaps you can't conceivably need to fear the man whose incapacity to defend himself against these cruel wrongs is so utterly obvious. If, however, it is your acquisition of the property of the late Sextus Roscius that makes you so determined to kill his son, Aren't you making it abundantly clear that you are afraid of a contingency which you must have less reason to fear than anyone in the world, that at some future date the children of the prescribed shall be given their father's property back? If you imagine, Chrysogonus, <coughs> that the validity of your purchase will be more effectively safeguarded by my client's death than by all that Sulla has achieved, you are surely misguided. But if you have no reason in the world for wishing the total ruin of this unfortunate man, if he has already handed over to you everything he possessed except the actual breath in his body, if he has not kept back so much as a single keepsake from his father's possessions, then heaven only knows what is the point of all this savage brutality, this monstrous relentlessness. I have never heard of a brigand or a pirate so utterly devoid of humanity that when he was in a position to plunder his victim without violence, he preferred nevertheless to tear the spoils by force off the man's very limbs amid a deluge of blood. My client, as you know perfectly well, has no possessions at all. He dare not do a thing. He cannot do a thing. He has never harboured the slightest hostility against your interests. And yet this human being, whom it is inconceivable that you should fear and entirely wrong that you should hate, whom you see to be so bereft of possessions that there is nothing left for you to take away from him any longer, is still, even now, the victim of your continued merciless attacks. I can only assume you must regard it as outrageous that he has even clothes on his back to take his seat in this court since he is the man, after all, whom you drove from his patrimony as bare as if he had come from a shipwreck. And yet you are presumably aware that he is being clothed and fed by Caecilia Metella, the daughter of Belyricus and his sister of Nepos. She is a lady who inspires profound respect. Her father was a famous man, her uncles illustrious, her brother highly talented, and she herself, woman though she is, 
has displayed virtues worthy of a man. The honour she derives from the eminence of her relations is amply matched by the distinction of her own noble character and confers upon them in return. However, what you really regard as so infuriating, I suspect, is the fact that Sextus Roscius is being actively defended here in this court. But believe me, if all his friends had felt that the ties of hospitality and friendship linking them to his father made it incumbent upon them to appear today, if they had ventured to speak out openly on his behalf, he would have had enough defenders and more to spare. Moreover, if each of them exacted vengeance in proportion to the greatness of injustice, and in proportion to the damage inflicted upon the national interest by the character of this trial, then heaven only knows it wouldn't be very long before you stop standing where you are. As it is, however, the situation regarded the younger Sextus Roscius' defence is surely not impressive enough to kindle our opponent's indignation. They can hardly suggest that they are being overcome by undue influence. His domestic needs, it is true, are being seen to by Caecilia Metella, as I have said, and Marcus Messala, and you can see for yourselves, is looking after his interests in the forum and in this court. If Messala were old and experienced enough, he himself would be pronouncing the defence of Sextus Roscius. But since his youthful years, combined with a natural modesty which does them credit, debar him from speaking, he has to entrust the brief to myself, in the knowledge that I felt both eager and obliged to fall in with his wishes in this way. Yet it was due to Marcella's perseverance, his efficiency, his influence and his hard work that the fortunes of Sextus Roscius were rescued from the tender mercies of the purchasers of the confiscated property and submitted instead, instead to the just verdicts of yourselves, judges. It was for the sake of members of the nobility, like Messala, gentlemen, that the greater part of our nation was recently up in arms. The aim of the war was to restore to public life the sort of nobleman who would act as you see Messella acting, who would defend, that is to say, the civil rights of an innocent person, who would stand firmly against injustice, who would show his powers by saving his fellow man rather than by striking them down. If everyone who has been born in that walk of life were to behave as he does, our country would be suffering less from this class and they themselves would be suffering less from the criticisms to which they are subjected. But I must warn you that there is a particular possibility which we have to face. I refer to the possibility that we shall not be able to persuade Chrysogonus to be content with seizing all our property. He may want to make an attempt on our lives as well. Although he has taken from us everything which was ours, it is likely enough that he still cannot be dissuaded from seeking to deprive us of that passion which is denied to no one the light of day itself. Our goods may not be sufficient to assuage his greed. His savagery may demand the sacrifice of our lifeblood as well. If this turns out to be the case, gentlemen, then Sextus Roscius has only one hope left, and it is the same unique hope which our entire country cherishes. I mean, your own traditional kind-heartedness and mercy. If these qualities abide, then salvation may still be ours even now. But if the cruelty which in these times stalks abroad throughout our nation should harden and embitter your hearts as well, though I cannot bring myself to believe that this will be so, then, gentlemen, we are finished. It would be better to spend one's life among wild animals than to dwell amidst the savagery which will then have overwhelmed us. Don't tell us, gentlemen, that this was the prospect for which our nation reserved your services. Don't assure us that the reason why you were chosen as judges was to inflict condemnation upon a man whom even property dealers and assassins had not managed to kill. At the outset of the battle, a very good general very often passes, posts his soldiers on the likely line of an enemy's retreat, with the intention that they should fall upon the fleeing foe and take them by surprise. Now, I expect the purchase of confiscated property, are hoping that you will proceed in the same sort of fashion. They probably imagine that the purpose for which you are sitting here is to catch the victims who have slipped through their own hands. But there they have obviously misjudged your characters. For heaven forbid, gentlemen, that this court, which our ancestors designated by the glorious name of our National Council, should be regarded as positively assisting these speculators to seize their gains. However, I am sure you understand judges that the manoeuvres of these individuals are aimed at nothing less 
than the complete elimination of the children of the prescribed by any means whatsoever, and that your sworn judgment and Sextus Roscius's trial are to be the first stages in this process. Surely the identification of his father's murderer could not possibly be clearer. On one side you see a specimen of these property purchases, malignantly hostile and murderous, and he has chosen to undertake the prescription of my client, the prosecution of my client, rather, in person. On the other hand, reduced to the depths of poverty, you see the murdered, murdered man's son, highly esteemed by his own relations, a person to whom not the smallest shred of guilt or even suspicion can conceivably be attached. In the whole case, there is one thing and one thing only which places Roscius in peril, the fact that his father's property was sold. But if, gentlemen, you really propose to support his enemy's cause and enable it to triumph, if the reason why you are sitting here is because of your determination that the children of those whose goods have been sold should be tried and condemned, then I beg you most earnestly to be vigilant indeed. For otherwise you will find that what you have done is to inaugurate another prescription, much more ruthless even so than the last. At least that was directed against men who were capable of taking up arms. Even so, the Senate refused to take responsibility for the operation, because they did not agree that the measure should be more severe than anything ever ordained by our ancestors, and should receive the sanction of our national authority. But the second prescription, which I am now forecasting, will fall upon the children of the prescribed, upon their infant sons still in their cradles. Unless, therefore, gentlemen, you show by your verdict in this trial that you find such a prospect entirely loathsome and horrible, then heaven only knows the lamentable condition into which you will be plunging our entire country. It is the duty of wise men like yourselves, equipped with the authority and power that have been entrusted to you, to apply the most effective remedies to the major troubles that affect our community. Now, you are all very well aware that the state which used to be regarded as exceptionally merciful to its external enemies is grievously oppressed by the cruelty with which the Romans themselves are being treated. Judges, it is up to you to stamp out this cruelty from our midst. Suffer it no longer to stalk abroad in our land, for it has destroyed many Roman citizens by terrible deaths, and it has had an, another lamentable result as well. By familiarizing us with evil in all its forms, it has stifled the sentiments of pity in the hearts of a hitherto merciful people. For when, hour by hour, we never cease see, seeing or hearing about some appalling deed, the constant repetition of horrors strains even the gentlest natures of every feeling of humanity.